Finally, we've made it our first official film lecture. Uh, in this case, it's going to be on American Beauty. This lecture is mostly going to focus on the first 20 minutes of the film. I'll give some context, a little bit of background, and then I really want to focus on the shots, the images, the colors, some of the lines that are used in that first 20 minutes. Um, this is a great film to introduce a film course with because it uses all of those elements of film form in really um, explicit ways. You can really see the choices the filmmakers are making. But also, it's a very um, idea-oriented film. It's almost an essay, in a way. Uh, so I hope it works out really well to understand, to get us to understand how film works. Quick side note, before I even jump in, uh, I was teaching this film a few years ago when the Kevin Spacey scandal came about. For those of you unfamiliar with it, there were some sexual, harass sexual harassment allegations against the Academy Award winning star of the film, Kevin Spacey, and he seems to have lost his career over this. Uh, it's not my place to make judgments about that. I, don't, I, I have no knowledge about that. I've read everything that's been published on it. There's just no, we don't know what's going on yet. Okay. But what I wanted to say is, I asked my class, so should we still study this film? And everyone in that class said, yes, absolutely. Not only is the film itself, it kind of teaches you how to watch film. So as a Sam Mendes film, an Alan Ball film, that's the director and writer, um, without giving power to the star, if you will, the film itself teaches one how to watch film while you're watching the movie. And that will make sense in a little bit. But the other thing they said was, if there are cultural and political problems around the film, well, why run away from those? Talk about them, use them, use the what's called the meta text or the meta level, the level of the film as it interacts with the real world on another level. The meta just means beyond or another level. Um, that that should be talked about. So if you are interested in that and that's something that you are familiar with, feel free to incorporate that into your discussions. Um, or ask me any questions about it. I have lots of ideas about it. I just don't want to focus too much on that before we talk about the movie. Speaking of, okay, the movie's written by a guy named Alan Ball. Some of you guys might know Alan Ball from his other work. Um, he has a television show called Six Feet Under, a television show called True Blood, that's the crazy vampire sex thing, um, and then a show called Here and Now on HBO. Most of the shows, no matter what else they're dealing with, they seem to be about people on spiritual quests, intellectual, emotional journeys, um, either with or against American culture, sort of how has culture offered me a narrative that gives me meaning and purpose, or how do I feel confined and trapped within the normal structures of American life? Um, and then how everyone seems to be on perhaps their own journey and how we help or hurt each other uh, sort of along the way. Sam Mendes, uh, called sort of a visionary director, um, he took Alan Ball's script, changed it ever so slightly, and we'll, we'll chat about that, um, the, the change he made in the second lecture about American Beauty. He made one very drastic change in the plot, which I think you'll have some ideas about. Um, the visual style of the film is, we, we sort of are familiar with it now. It was pretty stark, pretty beautiful, pretty provocative, pretty new in 1999 when this film comes out. When the film comes out, 1999. We had this kind of apocalyptic fervor. Uh, it sounds silly to say, but folks were truly worried about computers crashing, the world ending, people were buying generators, stockpiling water. Um, there's something called even numbers that makes us go kind of crazy, if, if I can get away with using that word. Um, and the film comes out in that context. So I think the film itself does have an apocalyptic fervor. The main character tells us right off the bat, I'm going to die in a year. Uh, and we kind of forget this is a movie about someone who knows he's going to die in a way, I'll, I'll explain that a bit. Um, so this idea of things ending, of the apocalypse, of something new coming from something old, these are things that were culturally uh, happening when the film emerged. The other thing is people have seen either love or hate this film when it came out, uh, so much so that it comes out actually in 1998 and then leaves theaters after a month. Uh, it just, no one seemed to enjoy it. And then it came back in 1999 uh, into the theaters. So I'm not sure of the politics behind that, but I remember thinking it was very, very strange, very odd at the time. Radio host, I'm thinking of a guy named Howard Stern, if he's still alive, he was saying things like, the movie is just the dumbest movie ever. There, nothing happens in it. There's no point to it. Um, and then uh, film critics and then viewers seem to be really excited, seem to be very inspired uh, or angry at the movie, which will become apparent in a few minutes why that might be. All right, we ready? Let's break it down. I feel like I have to put my coffee down for some reason and pick up a pen. Can't think without a pen in my hand. It's weird. Um, okay, let's jump in. American Beauty, the title. Uh, so obviously we're talking about America, American. What makes something American? And what makes American Beauty beautiful? 
Uh, is, American beautiful? is America beautiful? Um, where does beauty originate from? These questions seem to be posed by the title. But also, an American beauty is a type of flower and it's also a type of house. And if you think about that term, an American beauty home, well, America finds its sort of primary social structure to be the house. The house is the thing that in the American imagination creates family, creates a certain version of family. For us, a lot of times, white suburban families tend to be constructed by a house. Um, and then the idea of the flower, one of the main images we have of love, passion, romance, etc. So American Beauty sort of resonates in those ways. When you start watching the film, one of the first things you're going to do is not see something, but hear something. Yes, I had to touch my ear or else you'd have no idea that I was talking about hearing right now. Um, you're going to hear a sound that either is a film camera zooming forward, or more likely, if you ever, if any of you guys remember the idea of tape, you would actually put a, a video cassette inside of a film camera and then you'd hear the tape whine and be ready to record. So that's the first thing we hear. So before we watch the film, the film is kind of asking us through the sound design, through that sound of that film or that zoom, one, it's asking us to listen. Two, it's telling us this is a film about recording things. This is a film about looking closely, maybe even zooming in. It's a film that asks us to push in, pay attention, look closer, look more closely and maybe start recording things, whether that's a memory or actually on phone devices or something. Um, don't lose things. Don't lose memories. Don't lose um, activities, uh, events, experiences. Well, fights with that. That's sort of the idea that we play with. Then we open up, not on a cinematic image, not on this big, beautiful, 80 millimeter um, film image, but on a tiny, cheap, grainy film camera, which might suggest to us right off the bat, um, real. When we see that sort of footage, right, from like a documentary film or um, the news or something, it suggests that this is absolutely reality, that I'm just videotaping my girlfriend or a friend, which is what's happening in that opening scene. But think about yourselves on camera, on film. When you're being filmed, are you the most natural or are you playing things up for an audience? Um, do you just take a picture no matter what you look like or do you sort of uh, do your hair? Do you sort of make a certain look into the camera? My point is, what sometimes looks to be the most realistic is actually the most fake, uh, the most presented, the most manipulated. So those ideas of what's real and can we get to something real are right in those opening shots. The other thing about those opening shots, that really private, intimate moment we see, we talk about murdering family members. This is a film about family and maybe the intense um, interruptions that we experience uh, or can experience in family. And it might be about a daughter who wants to murder her, murder her father. Um, it might be about a father who is wildly sexually inappropriate. Uh, I think the exact line, I said, she says, I need a role model, not some horny geek boy who's going to spray his shorts every time I bring a friend home from school or something like that. It's, it's close. Um, and we have this idea of what boyfriends will do for girlfriends. Uh, her boyfriend on the other side of the camera says, you know, do you want me to kill him for you? And then this woman, Janie Burnham, her name is, stares right into the camera and says, deadpan, yeah, will you? And that's how the whole film opens. And then we hear that, that recording sound again or that zooming sound again. And then we start the film proper. Um, so we can write a whole paper on those images, what we see, what's important, some things to look out for. Janie Burnham's face, played by um, Thora Birch. We see blue eyes, white skin, and kind of bluish, or I'm sorry, reddish lips. Red, white, and blue. We're going to see red, white, and blue all over the place, but perhaps, perhaps nowhere more directly than on women's faces throughout the film. And this idea of different versions of America or different versions of an American beauty that we see. Okay, hopefully you're doing all right, because this is going to take some time, and I want to walk through these first shots and images, etc. Uh, so go ahead, grab a cup of coffee, Red Bull, um, get a sandwich, whatever you, whatever you need to do to sort of hang out with me here and walk through the beginning of this movie. Hopefully you're getting comfortable with my gesticulations with my hand and my head bobbing all over the place and all that crap. Hopefully it's not wildly uh, annoying for you. I do get excited when I talk about this stuff. Okay, back to American Beauty. The first thing we see after that opening shot of the video camera is of an open sky looking down on a suburban landscape. You'll notice that the suburban landscape is marked out almost with prison bars, straight lines. 
you know, this is what suburbia is, right? It's a manipulation of nature so that we can live here. We also see an open sky. And if you watch the camera, it sort of floats or zooms over. And that sky, a symbol of freedom and, and uh, liberation, goes away and goes away and goes away until we are just trapped in the bars of suburbia, right? And that's an idea that's going to come back a lot through the film is the sky and the sky is either an image of freedom or the lack of sky being something that makes us feel claustrophobic or trapped. Then we get something weird. We get a voiceover. So we get non-diegetic sound, sound that seems to come from somewhere else. Um, so this film, uh, I don't understand. Is, is this a ghost talking to us? This dude, this voice we hear is going to tell us within a year I'm going to be dead. So, oh my, I just realized I'm 42 and... Uh, I think he's 42 in American Beauty. That just gave me a very weird, haunting sort of moment. Um, hopefully I won't die within a year. Anyways, um, it almost is like he's, he's flying in like an angel or like Superman or like a ghost or like a god, sort of looking at the world and coming down. And he's going to go find his life and find this old world that he lived in. So the voiceover is someone who is no longer a living human being. And that gives us this whole other way of looking at the movie. Is it a gothic horror story? Um, is it a movie about life after death, etc.? And then he talks about his life. And as he gets closer and closer and closer, um, he says, you know, um, my name is Lester Burnham. Uh, and he talks about how boring his life is and that within a year he's going to be dead. Now, his name, Lester, might instantly make you think, Lester, Lester, the child molester. Uh, back in New York, where I'm from, that was sort of a common nursery rhyme, common, common children's rhyme. And that is part of what the film is about, is this older dude with, again, wildly inappropriate sexual desires toward uh, a very young girl. And I'm sure you'll have a lot to say about that, the creepiness of it, but also what it's trying to make us do and think about, because it's pretty disturbing, I think. Um, his last name, Burnham. If, when I teach this in class, I have my students actually say the name out loud a few times, and it sounds like we're chanting, burn him, punish him, uh, sacrifice him, right? Burn him. So that name, really interesting, Lester Burnham. We see him in bed, alone. It doesn't look like he's married. There's no love that was made in this bed anytime recently. It seems very vanilla, very whitewashed, very um, boring, for lack of a better word. He gets up, and then... He takes a shower, and sorry to talk about this a little explicitly, there's a weird scene of him, I shouldn't call it weird, there's a scene of him in the shower, and we have the voiceover, and he's masturbating. That term, self-love, right? Uh, there's lots of ways to read it. Um, the way I want us to think about it, perhaps, is perhaps this is a man who has so little self-respect, so little love, so little connection in his life, that the only thing that makes him feel at all is the... Um, self-manipulation of his body, right? Um, again, to get a little specific about it, there will be no children made from this sexual act. There's not even any pleasure in this sexual act. It just seems to be a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of non-boredom in the day. Uh, and that becomes pretty important, I think, throughout the film. Um, and he says, some, there's like a joke where he says, this is the high point of my day. And then we move on to his wife, Carolyn who looks like she thinks she's being videotaped. She's red, white, and blue face. She's cutting roses. Um, I have to put the pen down for this one. Roses are all over this movie. And one of the first images we see is of Carolyn taking a rose uh, and then cutting it at the stem. Watch where the rose, those roses show up. They're going to come in on the table. Um, they're going to come in on people's sweaters. They're going to be written in notebooks. We're going to see roses everywhere. And... To think about roses as symbols, they tend to symbolize, right, love, passion, romance, etc. But think about it. If you cut that rose and put it on the table, within a week it's dead. So the metaphor here might be this woman, Carolyn, is taking an image of love, passion, romance, killing it to present the image of love, passion, and romance. So I'm going to actually kill the real thing, but I'm going to present it as if I have it. So think about the way roses might work there. Some people also see roses as a wildly kind of uh, sexual image. Uh, throughout history, artists who maybe politically weren't allowed to paint the human body would paint nature as representations of the human body. So sorry if it's, it's a little creepy. Um, the idea of the rose petal uh, is often seen as female reproductive parts. Um, you might have heard the term to deflower somebody. 
uh, it comes from, again, the, this, this notion of virginity and uh, the flower. And then the stem, hopefully I don't need to keep talking about this, um, but you get the idea. It's it, it, basic sexual imagery, sexual body parts being used to think about power and maybe even love and, and uh, marriage. Okay, uh, we sort of zoom forward and we see Lester hanging out behind a window. And hopefully this idea of jail bars comes to your mind. He looks like he's in prison. And in a few minutes when you see him at work, you're going to see the same exact shot, except instead of him being in jail inside his home and home, he's going to be in jail inside a computer screen. The, the bars of these um, little numbers on his computer screen make him look like he is in prison. Then we go to his daughter. And his daughter, Janie, is looking at herself. She's thinking about getting breast uh, augmentation surgery done. Um, which, again, I mean, what do we do to uh, American children to make them feel so unbeautiful, so broken, that they need to manipulate their bodies to be accepted or to be loved, something like that. Um, so Janie comes uh, in the film in that way. And then we see the front of the house, clearly red, white, and blue, clearly a vision of America, with this uh, concrete walkway. It almost looks like a runway, like they're runway models, and the mom, Carolyn, is judging them as she's walking out. So Janie walks out. And uh, Carolyn, the wife, mother, um, real estate agent, says something to the effect of, are you trying to look unattractive? And Janie says, yes. Well, congratulations, you've succeeded admirably. Um, so when we're thinking about family and what we expect from mothers and daughters, yeah, there's maybe some quote unquote bitchy kind of fighting going on here, but these um, roles that they're both in, the mother is judging, critiquing, basically saying, if you're not beautiful, you're not really a good daughter. And then the daughter is saying, I know that's the expectation you have, and I want to fight against that a little bit. But there's also a deep sadness. Some people who have read this movie call it, uh, see a sort of um, either an employee relationship, like this mom is an employer and her daughter is an employee, or even prison guard, and that might be more appropriate in some ways. Lester comes out, looks like a loser, all hunched over. He doesn't seem to care about anything. His uh, briefcase flips open. He's a little down the ground pulling up his papers, and he says... My wife and daughter think I'm a sort of a big loser, and they're right. Um, so all of that kind of sets up the film to be about how do you transform your life? How do you understand that your life might not be what you thought it would be, what it could be? And if we're looking at America as the land of opportunity, the land of transformation, the land of risk and reward, then Lester Burnham has failed or is failing, even though he has an American Beauty wife, an American Beauty flower, an American Beauty house. So he's lived up to one vision of the American lifestyle, but he seems to lack its spirit, its core, right? Or at least the way we're sold that image. Then we see a car ride. Lester's in the back. His wife and his daughter are driving, right? And if the, the car is a metaphor for your life, his family is driving his life and he's taking a back seat to everything. He's also sleeping. And he says, I don't ever, I don't remember feeling so sedated. So this is also gonna be a film about feeling asleep and trying to wake yourself up. And then as he's talking about, maybe it's never too late to, to revivify yourself, to, to come back to life, we see the sky again outside the window. So hopefully this uh, very long setup is giving you some ideas about how to read the film in that those opening shots. Um, we have Lester, who's gonna try to figure out how to grow up, how to have a life worth living. We have Janie, how to accept myself, how to work through high school issues. We have Carolyn, gosh, how do I um, have control over my life and feel like my life is worthwhile? All this stuff is at play. A um, couple last notes before I let you go. Lester goes to work. I talked about the prison image. He gets pulled into the office and watch the visual design of those shots. Kind of, I'm looking at myself on the screen right now. It's kind of similar. He's in the middle of his room. He looks tiny, like maybe my guitars look bigger than I do right now or more important or my really creepy Clyde Barker oil paintings back here or something. Uh, Lester looks tiny and then they show Brad his can't believe I'm doing this right now. They show Brad, his boss, and he looks very powerful. And he's kind of above the camera. The camera angle's looking up and he fills the screen. The composition is boss and then employee. Employee, tiny little worthless piece of nothing. The ficus plant in the corner is more powerful than Lester Burnham. And he's basically told, uh, we might fire you. We might fire everybody. You have to write a justification for your life here at work. And Lester goes home and kind of argues with Jane, or I'm sorry, with Carolyn about that. Um, hopefully you'll spend some time looking at the study guide questions or the viewing questions um, as you watch American Beauty. Spend some time with this film. Pause it frequently. Think. Take notes. 
Um, sound is wildly important. You're going to realize that a lot of the um, a lot of the the music in the film is strange. It's purposefully detuned. It um, uses some un unfamiliar instruments and tonalities. Um, you're going to see a lot of visual design in the film and how things are composed, almost like paintings or photographs. Um, and then uh, look for things like, where are the roses in the movie? When are they there? When are they not there? Look at things like the video camera. When do we see a video image and when do we see a film image? And what might that be speaking? What would, might that be asking us to think about? Um, look for red, white, and blue throughout the movie. And this is a film about character and, and try to figure out how these characters interrelate, both as people, but then to recognize that, thinking about literary design, characters are not people. They are images and words. That's all they are. So as metaphors, how do all these characters work together? What what are they asking us to sort of think about, et cetera? I'm trying not to give too much away. I will ruin everything throughout the course. I don't want to ruin this first film too much uh, until you've watched it. So hopefully we'll see you in a couple hours with another lecture on uh, how to read American Beauty once you've actually watched the film. Good luck, guys.